Please welcome Golan Levin and Pablo Garcia. Hello, Portland. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> awesome. So this is pretty exciting for us. Uh, thanks to XOXO and Andes for inviting us. Um, but it's particularly exciting because we rarely get a chance to actually do this together. We live in different cities. We're so, really thrilled to be here. So we're going to see how this goes. We did a project together. We're, we'll talk about it in this talk. But to set it up for a little bit, we'll just talk a bit about, uh, some, about how some of our own work kind of fed into it and how we found commonality to, to launch the project that we did. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, a little bit of my work and talk about what I do, uh, Pablo. Uh, so the underlying theme of most of my work is uh, the creation of tools for others, uh, tools that empower people to discover their own potential as creative actors. And um, I've been working for about 20 years as what I would call a computational new media artist, uh, writing code to make art, uh, exploring the aesthetics of body-based and gestural interaction, making open-ended systems uh, like this one uh, that are only realized by the interactions of participants. Uh, in this system from 2005, for example, people are invited to create and perform the negative spaces that are formed around and between our bodies. Um, I've also been involved in uh, doing sort of tactical and critical and uh, sort of aesthetic investigations of the expressive use of robotics. Uh, so for example, <laughs> this, this here is a study in what I would call real-time character animation and in poetic surveillance. Uh, it's a... <laughs> It's an eight-foot-tall robot called Double Taker that lives on top of the roof of an art museum, and it sort of greets people as they come. And it's somewhere between like Sesame Street and Big Brother. Um, <laughs> it, does, it does convincing double takes uh, when it sees you to sort of try to suggest to its audience that maybe there's something worth a second look uh, in all of us. So since 2008, I've been involved in a gang of professional pranksters, uh, a collective called the Free Art and Technology Lab, or Fat Lab, which is dedicated to enriching the public domain through the release of uh, research and development of open source uh, tools for creation, uh, for creative technologies. Uh, the Fat Lab, um, uh, so one of my projects that has been released through them is uh, the Free Universal Construction Kit. It's a matrix of 76 adapter bricks that allow for complete interoperability between 10 popular children's construction systems like, like Lego and Tinker Toys. Um, the kit takes the form of a set of CAD files that are free. Anyone can download them, uh, 3D print it yourself with your MakerBot or what have you. Uh, parts of it are still protected by other people's patents. Uh, and so therefore, it's actually very legally murky um, and doesn't make an understatement. And as such, it actually um, meets a need which I believe is unmet and perhaps unmeetable by corporate manufacture and corporate interests. Um, so in order to make this, we have to reverse engineer the different connectors. Uh, which require great precision uh, for these all things to interoperate. And they actually work. Um, and there's even a universal adapter brick, which allows all 10 of the different <laughs> systems to inter interact together. Uh, for me, this is, it's less about making a tool for my, my son and daughter, um, as it is a metaphor, actually, of dealing with corporate siloing, what Bruce Sterling calls the stacks, the Google stack, the Apple stack, the Yahoo stack, and the ways that these things are sort of designed to frustrate us in their lack of interoperability. Um, so this solution, for me, demonstrates the idea of reverse engineering as a civic activity. Um, something that, that we do to help others. Uh, and as we'll see later, um, our joint project is also a kind of reverse engineering. Um, one last thing, nowadays I direct a lab at Carnegie Mellon called the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry. We are a lab for atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research at the intersection of arts, science, technology, and culture. And I'm really honored to have the, uh, the relationship of uh, basically supporting and mentoring and producing other people's projects. So I'm totally honored, for example, to have been uh, worked as the executive producer, I guess they called it, of uh, Clouds, which is showing tonight, you should all see it, by James George and Jonathan Menard. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Pablo. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, I'm trained as an architect, um, but I spent my life drawing. And for a long time, I've been fascinated with reverse engineering art history and historical techniques of art making. And so that's me drawing with a replica 17th century drawing machine. Um, now, art and technology have had a long intermixed relationship. Uh, drawing machines, these optical and mechanical aids to drawing go back to the early Renaissance. And in a, one project, I wondered, what would a drawing machine today draw? Like, what would it want to draw? And so if it was anything like me, uh, perhaps it would have an interest in its own history and its ancestors. Uh, so I modified a CNC router with a custom pen attachment and had this drawing machine 
draw historical drawing machines from the Renaissance all the way up to a 1950s pen plotter. Uh, the project is called Machine Drawing, Drawing Machines. Um, and I'm almost fascinated by like, what new meanings emerge when you reconstruct art historical tools and themes today. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, some of these like, ma magical effects retain their magic centuries later. Uh, like this 18th century optical illusion. Uh, for example, mirrored cylinders were this rare piece of technology a long time ago um, and limited availability. So effects like this were visible only to a few. Um, but if you make your own illusion, um, it's pretty easy to kind of install them nowadays in, in a variety of places. <laughs> and, and so in this brief project, I made a hundred of these and when I was living in Pittsburgh and I placed them all around town with this memento mori skull so people unaware would suddenly find out, wait, thou art mortal, right? <laughs> so left around in classrooms and chemistry labs, kind of hard to see in there, and probably most cruelly, um, hospitals. <laughs> well, <laughs> to be fair, I was in the hospital with my wife having our second child, so it was positive for us too. Anyway, um, and then one last project, um, you know, another example of art history meeting the contemporary, this project pairs unlikely partners. Uh, this project is called Webcam Venus that I did with artist Addie Wagonecht. Um, and we spent a month asking sex cam performers to pose like famous paintings. Um, and we captured all their video and, and produced it as a, as, a, as a video piece with their, with their permission. But the project's about notions of beauty and the social culture, cultural context for beauty. You know, sex cams are called pornography, but fine art nudes are classic. And the project problematizes this institutional narrative of acceptable beauty. So now our work together. Um, so what brought us together? Well, we're both educators, uh, and we have a shared interest in reverse engineering, uh, drawing, tool making, and media archaeology, which we could call the history of media technologies, especially ones that have been forgotten or abandoned. And this resulted in, um, this overlap resulted in our Kickstarter project from last year called the Neo Lucida. Um, so a little bit of background. We both have a lot of art students uh, who think that realistic drawing equals good art. Um, and usually, uh, you know, they've, they come from, you know, conservative backgrounds and they, this is what they've been exposed to, um, but also because realistic drawing is sort of hard and so it's a good worthy thing to sort of set as a goal. Um, and this proposition has proven surprisingly durable. Uh, in spite of nearly two centuries worth of reproduction technologies like photography uh, that have made drawing in certain contexts obsolete. Um, so many people uh, believe, in fact, the old masters were superhuman in their drawing ability. And there's even a book um, uh, by David Hockney, which is, was really the touchstone for us. Um, it's called Secret Knowledge, Rediscovering the Lost Techniques of the Old Masters. And he presents an incredibly uh, controversial position, which puts forward compelling evidence that the old masters may have actually used optical aids to achieve their camera-like precision, and that they did so in a way that was a closely guarded trade secret, because they didn't want just anyone else knowing how to make these incredibly realistic drawings. Uh, so it's a very controversial theory. I've even gotten into fights with museum directors who say, that book is nonsense, you know? And, and, um, and it suggests, as my students would say, and this is why it's so controversial, that the old masters were somehow cheating uh, to use optical aids. Um, now, ha yeah, Hockney's thesis, you know, is based in part in his personal experience. He accounts uh, his times like building old devices and getting old machines, like the camera Lucida that you see him using here, and drawing with it to kind of draw this connection to the past. Um, now, the camera Lucida invented in 1807 uh, prior to the invention of chemical photography. It's a device that lets you trace what you see. So there's this prism, and you look down into the prism, and it's essentially a beam splitter. It superimposes the scene in front of you onto your paper, but you can also see your hand, and so you can just basically trace real life in real time. Um, but since Hockney's experience was about, like, personally looking through this device, I thought that this was important to kind of, well, do this myself. So, eBay and vintage stores, I found a bunch of different old uh, camera lucidas, and I started drawing with them to kind of to feel it out myself, you know, landscapes or uh, still life drawings. I have this habit of drawing hotel beds the morning after I've slept in them um, as these kind of ephemeral places. Um, and then Golan asked me one day if I'd ever heard of secret knowledge, and I responded to him by showing my camera Lucida, and he was, in his words. I was blown away. I mean, <laughs> it, it actually totally reinstilled in me, like, 
the love of drawing that I had left um, some years earlier. Um, but it also just it awakened me, like, this has to be right. Yeah, and so we wonder what would it take to get all of our students to have this experience as well and decide for themselves, effectively teach the controversy. There's a major problem. <laughs> There's a major problem, though, which is that um, if you want to get a camera lucida, it's basically three to five hundred dollars on eBay. They haven't been manufactured in a hundred years, um, and even though they were very popular in the 1800s as a way of, of drawing, um, so we decided to make our own, and uh, at a cost that would make it accessible to anyone, um, as a way of sort of giving it to our students to kind of prompt them to have the same kind of realization, or even just to have the kind of question uh, that they might be able to question their heroes. So a camera lucida. It's basically just a prism on a stick. Uh, the stick is the easy part. Uh, the prism, the, the specific prism, is not technically sophisticated or advanced, but it hasn't been made to, to the specific dimensions that are required by the camera lucida in 100 years. Um, and we made a simple prototype uh, using some hacked parts or covered prism from an older uh, camera lucida and a gooseneck and a clamp. But to get new prisms, we realized that we would need to make a minimum order of 500. Uh, that was just the only way to get one made. And so we figured with some luck, we could maybe get 500 people to help us. So we went to Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently people found it compelling. Uh, for some, it was their chance to actually test Hockney's theories. Uh, you know, for themselves, like really be part of that. And for others, it really was just simply a new doorway to drawing, whether they've drawn before or have always wanted to draw. Um, and so we went to work, and that's a long story in itself, but we delivered 15,000 units within five months of the Kickstarter, all in time for Festivus. Yay, <laughs> big delivery story. It was all great. Uh, we can tell you that story uh, at another time. And we'll, we'll come back to that story in a little while, yeah. but, but what we'd like to do now, actually, we've been thinking about this project because it's, it's for us, we never really intended it as a business. Uh, or even as a product necessarily, and I, I wanted to talk about three sort of speculative reinterpretations or reimaginings of our project that we've been sharing in our own minds uh, for the year or so since we did it. And the first and foremost of these was that it's actually an educational project. Its purpose was pedagogy, uh, to inform and to empower and to prompt questioning. And we did something a little unorthodox as part of our Kickstarter, um, which probably only our Kickstarter backers are aware of. Um, we used the Kickstarter's update feature, which is generally used for shipping updates, like, you know, like check your emails or whatever, uh, instead to present a series of lectures about media archaeology uh, and art history. Uh, we, we called them uh, uh, interludes, and it, it, the effect of doing this was to turn the project from a Kickstarter sort of pitch for a product, maybe, uh, instead into a massive open online course, or MOOC. Um, so here's uh, one of our lectures, interlude number four. Uh, Pablo writes these, he's the expert on, on this, uh, about camera lucida optics in this case. And while that's scrolling by, I'd like to read this email that uh, we shared together, um, which kind of explains the philosophy of it. Have you noticed how many backers, Pablo, sincerely address us as professors in the comments and the messages? What if the reason people were moved to pay us $30 was not because we, we, was because we taught them something new and not necessarily because they wanted a hunk of metal and glass? Let's reimagine the Neo Lucia Kickstarter as a MOOC. In this parallel universe, backers are students, and their pledges are their tuition. They pay according to their means, and that's fine. Then the Neo Lucida device is not the thing we're actually selling. Uh, instead, it's merely the mortal coil of what the students are actually paying for, education. And in this instance, on the topics of media, archaeology, and art history, and the history of technology. It's an education that these students can't or didn't uh, get otherwise. And then the Neo Lucida device is the student's graduation present, uh, for some, it may be just a souvenir of the experience, and for others, it's the free set of tools when you graduate. Nicely timed. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, got away. There we go. The next speculative reimagining was a way in which we were thinking about this entire Kickstarter project as a kind of performance piece. Uh, the whole thing, the, the Kickstarter, the product design, the customer service emails, the many customer service emails, going to China to make it happen, uh, that it was all one big long durational piece of performance art, uh, which was, whose purpose was made to provoke a critical reassessment of heroes, like the old masters, the hero mythology, to provoke people into contemplating the relationship of art and technology, and to confront the haters and doubters with a tangible tool that would actually enable the testability of, of Hockney's hypothesis. 
So how? Well, one of the things that we did was actually realize that the project is addressing all of these simultaneously. Because Kickstarter is this crowdfunding platform. Uh, the, the MOOC is this crowd learning environment. Uh, and then the crowd empowering tools, because the project is open source and open source hardware. Um, and DIY, which I think we originally thought of like, well, people can kind of hack and make their own. But we realized that, no, no, in fact, the whole project is a giant DIY experiment in allowing people to actively question these widely uh, held uh, unexamined assumptions, right? They're doing the hypothesis themselves. They're actually there themselves. And thirdly, uh, the search for Dan Winkler. Who, you may ask? Uh, this is Dan. And he is one of our original Kickstarter backers. And he has done one Neil Lucida drawing every day this year. And this is his drawing from yesterday that he posted on, on Flickr. Now, we don't know Dan personally at all. He was basically uh, a, an original backer. We know that the project gave him this push to become enthusiastic about learning to draw. Uh, and he's the one who's taken it the farthest. So in this reinterpretation of the Neil Zito project, all of this is like this one giant machine to seek and find this one guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> Next slide. There's <laughs> because between the original Kickstarter and then subsequent production runs, we've made around 23,000 Neo Lucidas and shipped them around the world. We've effectively tripled the number of camera Lucidas in existence. We think. We think. Um, now, fewer than that, of people have actually opened the box. You know, you give it as a gift, it sits in a closet somewhere. Now, few, few and fewer, like, pull it out and really use it. And even fewer still draw with it regularly. But Dan, he stands alone. So here's uh, the blurb, the takeaway, the, the place where the mainstream press uh, did and, and you know, started and ended. And to be sure, our project, we, we, we like to think, is a testament to the power of systems which scaffold the maker movement, uh, in particular crowdsourcing economies like Kickstarter. And yet, it's something much more complicated about which we're actually both somewhat ambivalent. Um, yeah, so for example, we had this mindset, because we're trained in design, and, uh, that off the shelf, would be this way to save money and make the new Lucida inexpensive for our backers because custom equals expensive, right? We all know this. So all throughout um, China, yeah. Right. So, so we would ask China, you know, our manufacturers there, our productions, like, well, what gooseneck lengths do you have laying around? So we can just pick the one that's there, it's cheapest, we'll just make that work. Well, and what, they say, or what thumb nut? Yeah. yeah, like what sizes do you have just on the shelves? And they say, well, none. Just tell us the lengths you want and we'll cut it. And we're like, huh. So we say off the shelves, but it turns out China doesn't have shelves. <laughs> right? There is no shelf. Yeah. So, so <laughs> it's strangely, the, the, the cost of making a thousand of our prototype, which used off the shelf parts, was really only pennies different from making a fully custom version of the same unit number. Um, and we were like, wait, how is that possible? I mean, so, so one thing is, let's, let's go to China. This is our factory in Dongguan, China, in southern China, outside of Guangzhou. Uh, and what you have is the factory on the right, and it has floors for injection molding and painting and final assembly. And on the left is the dormitory, uh, where the factory workers live, two to a room. And this is a standard pattern. The thousands of factories all around China are just like this. Um, this particular factory makes a lot of toys, like plastic toys you see everywhere. So here's an assembly line next to ours making these like ice cream and dessert toy kits for kids. Uh, and then here's our assembly line. Here are the 10 men and women who worked with us for two weeks uh, to make 15,000 Neo Lucidas in mid-2013. Uh, they're holding cards in which they've written their names. They work six days a week. Uh, for 11 hours a day, uh, for $1.50 an hour. Uh, they tell us that this is considered a good job and that ours is one of the best factories in Dongguan. Uh, and even so, it's mind-numbing work, and we can't even begin to describe the ecological toll that we learned, as we saw, in addition to the obvious personal toll that it takes on them. So, so here's one of our workers. This is uh, Pan Haikui. Uh, and he's working assembling the eyepieces, which is the, the most important part and the most delicate part of, of assembling, right? It's the most critical station. You carefully secure the glass prism inside the eyepiece, and you drill a little shield on top of it. And this is all hand-assembled. But he was able to do about 1,000 a day. 
right? And so even though this is a factory, uh, you know, it's a highly human and consultative process. We're there talking to different people on the factory floor, like about interacting with them, watching them as they, as they assemble these things and talking to them about the process. Um, it's very human. And these people are pros. Um, we sat on the lines ourselves, uh, and we can tell you, I mean, there was absolutely no way we could keep up with them. Uh, it was like Charlie Chaplin in modern times trying to, to, to come anywhere close. The stuff was just coming at me so fast. I was like, I couldn't imagine doing it as fast as they could at all. So I think, just concluding, I think one of the things that we really want to impress upon you is that we learned is all of our stuff, and, and by all of our stuff, I mean all of our stuff, our basic stuff in the world, is actually handmade. Even when it looks like it's not. Even when it looks, uh, or when you think uh, that lots of machines and automation are involved, um, there's handprints on there, and we can see those handprints now. It's a thing. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>